Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we learn about a new report on radionuclides in the Great Lakes Basin and the call to get them designated as a chemical of mutual concern for the U.S. and Canada. We talk with Ontario-based John Jackson, a veteran environmentalist, on why this campaign is so important and what we can do to support it. Then we check in with Jane Swanson of San Luis Obispo Mothers for Peace on a piece of California legislation that could inadvertently trigger support for keeping the Diablo Canyon nuclear reactors in operation much, much longer than is safe for children and other living beings. That was not the intention of that piece of legislation. At least, we don't think so. Plus, our popular Num Nuts of the Week feature, Nuclear Reactor Duck, and Cover Report, and enough honest nuclear information to get us forcibly ejected from a Trump rally. All of this coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, March 22nd, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Starting off with the international report with all eyes on Belgium, where yesterday, March 21st, a terrorist attack on both the Brussels airport and a subway station has resulted in at least 34 confirmed dead and 187 issued. Security was immediately stepped up at both the Doel and the Tehange nuclear reactors in Belgium. Then, earlier today, March 22nd, the nuclear power plant at Tehange in eastern Belgium was evacuated, aside from the essential staff. The evacuation order came from Belgian authorities, but details about why the order was given were not immediately available. Interestingly, it was just last Thursday, March 17th, that communities and campaigners in Germany, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg lobbied for the closure of two of the aging 40-year-old Belgian nuclear reactors because they were close to their borders. Thirty major cities and districts from those three countries joined forces to try to shut down the reactors. Cologne and Dusseldorf in Germany, Luxembourg City, and Maastricht in the Netherlands are among the cities co-funding a lawsuit to close to Hange II and calling on the European Commission to prepare a separate case at the European Court of Justice. Tehange II and Duel III reopened in December after a repair process that lasted 21 months, but Duel III on the Dutch border had to be shut down again one week later. The 40-year-old reactors have been plagued by a litany of problems, such as reactor pressure vessel microcracks, fires, and one mysterious case of sabotage. Now they add to their problems the potential for a terrorist attack. Shut them down. Shut them all down. In India, at last report, we were in day five of an accident at the Kakraport nuclear reactor in Gujarat on the western coast of that country. India's Atomic Energy Regulatory Board issued a statement. It said that the leak, which it earlier said was large, is continuing, and plant authorities continue to pour coolant over it. I guess that means water, which raises mental images of what happened at Fukushima when Masao Yoshida directed the pouring of tons upon tons of salt water onto those melting-down reactors. The AERB offered no information on radiation counts or the condition of workers, just reassurances that there was no real danger, even as the leak, to the best of our knowledge, continues, and workers have not been able to go inside to fix it as the radiation levels are too high. Of course, there was no reporting on this in the national media. And if you look back to a news story on March 10, the Indian government has approved, in principle, 46 sites 
for new nuclear reactors. Numnuts does not even begin to describe it. An exhibition in Ethiopia about the Fukushima nuclear disaster was scrapped, following complaints from the Japanese embassy that the content was inappropriate. The exhibition, planned by volunteers of the Japan International Cooperation Agency, was supposed to be part of the Japan Festival held in the Ethiopian capital of Addis Ababa on October 31, 2015. Why are we catching up with this story now? First of all, it's just now showing up in the news feeds, and secondly, Vice Foreign Minister Seiji Kahara. On March 16, apologized for having completely shut the door on the Fukushima exhibit. Too little, too late. The festival, jointly hosted by the Japanese embassy, the Japan International Cooperation Agency, and other agencies to promote a better understanding of Japan. Well, at least they've got an understanding of Japan from this action. Anyway, the event went off as scheduled in the East African nation. But the exhibition about the accident at Fukushima was called off after the embassy warned that it might withdraw its participation in the event. Who do they think they are, Donald Trump? An official of the Japanese embassy criticized the content, telling the volunteers it is inappropriate at a time when the central government is working hard to dispel groundless rumors regarding the disaster. Propaganda and censorship—that's what this is. The group also received an email from the embassy saying, "If the exhibition is one that runs counter to the policies of the central government, such as by taking an anti-nuclear in quotes stance, it would be difficult for us to jointly host the event." Bullies never can take criticism, and it has been found that radioactively contaminated wild boars. Pigs, sheep, and deer are still unfit to eat in Japan, Russia, Europe, Norway, the UK, and more, because of Chernobyl, Fukushima, and Three Mile Island. This is a rather extensive article, and we will have a link to it up on the website nuclearhotseat.com under this episode number two forty-eight. Back here to the U.S., where more than a dozen airmen who provide security for a nuclear missile base in Wyoming are under investigation for illegal drug activity. This, according to Defense Department officials, the Air Force is investigating 14 junior enlisted airmen from the 90th Security Forces Group at the F.E. Warren Air Base outside Cheyenne, Wyoming. About one third of the Minuteman III force of 450 intercontinental ballistic missiles are operated by the 90th Missile Wing. That means that 150 nuclear warhead-loaded missiles were under the influence of airmen who were under the influence of what is allegedly cocaine. Last year, three launch officers pleaded guilty to using ecstasy. After an investigation into illegal drug possession uncovered roughly 100 officers involved in a cheating scandal, can you think of any other reasons why we should take that one trillion dollars and instead of upgrading our nuclear arsenal and switching over to genuine renewables? Because let's face it, even on ecstasy, no terrorist ever attacked a solar panel. Now for the nuclear reactor duck <coughs> and cover report. Last Thursday, March seventeen, at Grand Gulf Nuclear Reactor Station in Mississippi, a lightning strike to an off-site power source caused a loss of power in the service shutdown cooling system and associated system actuations. That's a lot of NRC gobbledygook to say. It got hit by lightning. It shorted out the power, and the cooling systems shut down. <coughs> On Friday, March 18, at Watts Bar in Tennessee, the loss of emergency and auxiliary gas treatment systems. Two paragraphs of NRC gobbledygook later, we learn that this was a condition that could have prevented the fulfillment of a safety function. <coughs> 
and the Union of Concerned Scientists annual review of U.S. nuclear power plant near misses finds more than 60% of safety violations occurred at Entergy plants. There were 10 near-miss accidents at U.S. nuclear reactors last year, and more than 60% of the violations occurred at three facilities owned by Entergy Corporation. A near-miss incident is an event or condition that could increase the chance of reactor core damage by a factor of 10 or more. The Union of Concerned Scientists initiated its annual review in 2010, and since that time there have been 91 near misses at nuclear power plants, and that's only through the end of 2015. Last year's near misses occurred at Calvert Cliffs in Maryland, Duane Arnold in Iowa, Fort Calhoun in Nebraska, Indian Point in New York, North Anna in Virginia, Pilgrim in Massachusetts, River Bend in Louisiana, and Virgil C. Summer in South Carolina. Entergy owns Indian Point, Pilgrim, and River Bend, which also experienced a near miss in 2014. And that's this week's Duck <laughs> and Cover Report. Speaking of Indian Point, at midnight on December 12 of last year, the final license for Indian Point Energy Center's reactors expired. To mark the event, about 50 people walked up the road to the entrance of the nuclear power plant in Buchanan, New York. As they stretched yellow caution tape to block workers' access, they were told to disperse. Eleven of them did not and were arrested. Last Thursday, March 17, represented by attorney Marty Stolar, the Eleven had their hearing in court. They all, on advice of attorney, pled guilty, and the judge let them off with time served, but no fine. They told the media, yes, we are guilty, and we might have to do it again. According to a Gallup poll, for the first time since they asked the question in 1994, the majority of Americans say that they oppose nuclear energy. 54% opposing it is up significantly from 43% just one year ago, while the 44% who favor using nuclear energy is down from 51%. Now let's get to work on that 44% that has been brainwashed by the nuclear industry. So where do the candidates for President of the United States stand on nuclear issues? Now the truth is being told. Bernie Sanders has made climate change a central pillar of his campaign for the Democratic nomination for president, and he is adamant that nuclear power has no place in his vision of the nation's cleaner future. Hillary Clinton, on the other hand, believes, quote, nuclear energy has an important role to play in our clean energy future. This according to Jake Sullivan, Clinton's policy director. Sanders argues for a moratorium on nuclear power plant license renewals in the United States. Clinton was pro-nuclear power in 2007, changed her mind in the midst of that campaign in 2008, and stated that she was against it. Then, as of February of 2016, her campaign platform states again that she is once more in favor of it. And when Republican candidate Donald Trump was asked, what's your priority among our nuclear triad, meaning the B-52s, the missiles and submarines, all of which are aging out, Trump was his usual incoherent mess. We'll have a link up to that article because I can't do it justice in the time I've got. What do you do with an unfinished, abandoned nuclear power plant? The Tennessee Valley Authority is taking suggestions on what to do with its Belfont nuclear plant in Alabama, which the TVA quit building in 1988 but has kept on mothballs ever since. One suggestion is to turn Belfont into an amusement park, similar to the 135-acre Wunderland Kalkar, built on the site of a former nuclear power plant north of Dusseldorf, Germany. Thrill-seekers who would visit Belfont would be safe from radiation because the plant never went into production. The cooling towers could be converted into giant climbing walls. The Southern Alliance for Clean Energy suggested that perhaps Belfont could be used as a film production set. The plant, after all, is located in Hollywood, even if it is only the 1,000-resident Hollywood, Alabama. 
They could convert the abandoned reactor buildings into condos for folks who want that post-apocalyptic look. Or use the spent fuel pond in the reactor for a swimming pool that only has a deep end. But the best suggestion of all came from Lou Zeller, executive director for the Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League. He said, I think we should use the land and transmission facilities there for a giant solar farm. We'll let you know what they decide. Over to Japan, where on Monday, March 21st, Two British ships arrived in the eastern part of that country to transport a shipment of plutonium, enough to make dozens of atomic bombs, back to the United States for storage under a bilateral agreement. So Japan seems to be taking a lead from Germany in how to get rid of their nuclear materials. In Germany's case, it was nuclear waste that we agreed to take back way back in the Eisenhower Atoms for Peace era, and now we seem to be stuck with it unless there were enough comments and complaints to the NRC while that subject was open for debate. But when you look at the fact that both Germany and Japan are shipping nuclear materials back to the U.S., it makes one wonder if perhaps revenge is a dish best served cold And perhaps World War II isn't quite as over as we might have hoped. The U.S. is starting to look like the nuclear waste dump of the Northern Hemisphere. We're going to be posting some links up on the website. One about a TV program from the Yomiuri, which looks at the issue of health hazards of radioactivity. It cites three separate nuclear site workers who had been at Fukushima Daiichi, and who had severe illnesses based upon doses of radiation they had been exposed to that were supposedly in the safe range. The program ends with a quote about what was done to the workers. It's just plain murder. And another link will be to an article, Gone Fishing, Fukushima at Five Years, by EnviroReporter.com, which follows Japanese fishermen off the coast of Fukushima despite the fact that the waters were hot with radiation. But as the men said, the fish were plentiful, and if they didn't pass rad testing, they could be sold overseas. That would be us. And you probably thought I forgot, but now... Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that sound a week. You know... Nuclear is such a pain in the gazorcus that sometimes a body just wants to go out and drink too much. Just, if you decide to do so, drink responsibility and do not drink Fuko wine, a.k.a. recovery wine. It's a sparkling wine. It's a cider. It's a big mistake because it is made entirely from fruit grown across Fukushima Prefecture. You see, it is intended not just to be an alcoholic beverage. It is intended to send a clear message to consumers that the prefecture's produce is safe and dependable. Even if it's not, but we'll never know for sure because nobody's testing the stuff. So it's not just wine, it's propaganda. In case you doubt that, note that this is a project that joined together the Koryama Municipal Government, Koryama being one of the towns in Fukushima Prefecture, and the Mitsubishi Corporation Disaster Relief Foundation. That's right, Mitsubishi, makers of flawed steam generators, the ones that ultimately took down the San Onofre nuclear reactor because they couldn't be trusted to be started. For now, The number of bottles produced is so small that the wine will only be available in Fukushima Prefecture. However, the winery is eyeing future shipments to the Tokyo area and beyond. Mitsubishi Corporation Disaster Relief Foundation Vice Chairman Yasuhito Hirota said, I'd like to see this winery spread its wings and find success worldwide. That's right. It is a Japanese philosophy that when it comes to Fukushima, they want to share the pain and spread it around. So they've got bottles of wine where we know there's wine in them, but what else might there be? Ah, I guess they're just not looking. 
And that's why, to be honest, anybody who drinks this stuff is this week's nuclear hot seed. None that's out of the week. I mean, if you're going to drink something disgusting, there's always Manischewitz heavy Malaga. And finally, for my favorite quote of the week, we turn to Jay Truman, founder of the Downwinders organization who was featured in the documentary Downwinders, which was recently shown at the Latter-day Saints Film Festival. Thank you, Mormons. In the film, Truman shows a map of Enterprise, a town in southwestern Utah, about 40 miles north of St. George, which was directly downwind from the nuclear testing sites. On the map, Every X marks a home where someone died of cancer, and almost every home in the tiny town, which was in the direct path of the fallout from the bomb tests, has an X. Truman said the ABCs for Enterprise are A is for atomic, B is for bomb, C is for cancer, and D is for dead. We'll have this week's featured interviews in just a moment. But first, Nuclear Hot Seat is listener-supported and relies on your donations to help us keep getting the word out about nuclear in a way that you're not likely to encounter on mainstream media. Right now, in addition to the monthly expenses that we always run into here at Nuclear Hot Seat, I am fundraising for the long-term goal of attending the Excellence in Journalism Conference to be held this September in New Orleans. Over 1,000 journalists, news directors, editors, syndicators, and network reps all in one place at one time. It's an ultimate opportunity to network with those people who have full control over how nuclear is presented and to influence our coverage for years to come. So whatever you can do to help us meet these goals, please give what you can. You know, a great place to start is with a Starbucks donation, the equivalent of a cup of coffee, the best cup of coffee I will never drink. So go to NuclearHotSeat.com, click on the big red donate button, and know that whatever amount you can offer is deeply appreciated, and I am deeply grateful for your support. I love speaking with activists I never knew existed on issues I never knew existed. It's kind of a win-win, and this one is terrific. John Jackson is a Canadian environmentalist who has worked with citizens groups for the past 35 years with a focus on Great Lakes issues, waste management issues, water quality and quantity issues, and public participation and consultation. He's the author of the report issued by the Canadian Environmental Law Association on March 2nd, calling for radionuclides to be designated by the United States and Canada as a chemical of mutual concern under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. More than 100 groups signed on to this report, including Nuclear Hot Seat, because they and we recognize the dangers of the high concentration of nuclear facilities that surround the largest surface freshwater repository in the world. John Jackson spoke to us from his home in Ontario, Canada. John Jackson, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Let's start out with the problem with radionuclides in the Great Lakes Basin. The main problem is is that we have a huge conglomeration of facilities that have high levels of radionuclides in them. We have over 40 nuclear power plants around the Great Lakes Basin, both in Canada and the United States. The only lake that doesn't have a facility like that on it is Lake Superior, but every one of the other lakes does. Attached with each one of those is a waste disposal site for high-level radioactive waste as well as low-level waste. We have facilities in the north end of Lake Huron, for example, where they used to do mining for uranium. They're closed now, but we all know mines. They still leak. There's still these piles of radioactive materials sitting there. We have facilities for processing the radionuclides, the uranium, to make them become the fuel for the nuclear power plants. So it's this huge mix of radioactive operations all around the basin, and 
in coming out all near the shore. That's where they were built deliberately, is near the shoreline. And we have no understanding of what is the full impact of all those facilities cumulatively in terms of the Great Lakes. What monitoring now takes place of the various radionuclides? Well, this is one of the problems, is that, yes, there is monitoring required in most of their permits to operate, but very often that information is not available to the public. Secondly, they're not all monitoring for the same things, and therefore you can't cumulatively pull the data together from all the facilities and say, this is how much of a particular substance is going out. That's particularly true when you look at the differences between the U.S. and Canada in terms of what we require in monitoring. And they also don't really look and say, what do we have out in the waters? They're only looking at their own small facility. Well, they're large facilities usually, but their own facility. And they're not looking and saying, okay, if you combine this with that other one that's just a few miles up the road, and if you combine it with that other one, that waste site over there, what's being released? And the data is not available in a way that you can combine those, even if it is publicly available, and often it isn't. You bring up an interesting issue in that the Great Lakes are bordered by both Canada and the United States. What legal framework is there for the countries to work together on this precious shared water resource? There is an agreement that we have between the U.S. and Canadian governments called the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. And this was first formed back in the 1960s, and this was the time when Lake Erie died, as they said, or was very close to dying because of the huge phosphorus growth and the fish were not getting enough oxygen to be able to live and were washing up on shore. So they got the agreement for that. Then they started becoming aware of more toxic substances so they expanded it to include things like PCBs, dioxins, furans, uh, flame retardants, those toxic chemicals that we've become aware of. And now we're trying to get radionuclides to be one of the items that they develop a joint strategy, U.S.-Canada joint strategy, to deal with the problem in the Great Lakes. Your group and perhaps a hundred others have come together to ask for an official designation. As a chemical of mutual concern under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. What would this designation do and who would be granting it? Ultimately, the designation has to be provided by the two federal governments. And it's going to take, we're not foolish, we know the uh, industry is very strong in trying to protect itself and keep out of the public eye. Uh, It's going to take some real pressure on our part to push the governments to designate it as a substance of concern. If we win that designation, that's why we have over 110 groups already supporting it, and we're working to get more and from a range of sectors. But when we get that designation, what then happens is the governments are required to jointly develop a strategy for dealing with the radionuclides in the basin, both Canada and U.S., a joint strategy, and the public be involved in developing that strategy. And to us, this is one of the most important outcomes of the designation, is to have real public involvement in the development of a strategy. And that strategy will include a range of things. One of them, very basically, is making sure that proper monitoring is being done on all facilities, that we have standard ways of doing that monitoring, and that the public has access to that information. The second thing, that we'll be pushing for in that strategy, and it is in the agreement to require them to do it. So it isn't just that we're doing this out of, you know, the idea of dreams of our heads. It's actually in the agreement the two governments signed, is to actually do an assessment of what are the cumulative impacts of all of these sources, past, predicted in the future, in terms of the impacts on the environment, on the impacts on the fish, on the wildlife, on people, because the studies on that have been so limited, we we really don't have a good understanding. And the other component, of course, is, okay, what do we do about it? What preventive actions can we take to keep things from getting worse? 
what actions can we take to make sure that when someone applies for an approval to build or expand a plant or applies for approval to have a waste disposal facility for radioactive waste, what are the criteria for that? Do we have tough enough criteria? And in our minds, we really have to be looking at moving towards a phase-out, a reduction of these types of facilities being used, not just in the Great Lakes Basin, but elsewhere, of course. It isn't just the Great Lakes Basin issue. This brings to mind a question about Ontario power generation and their plans, their desire, their push to build a high-level radioactive waste depository, meaning dump, less than one mile from the shores of Lake Huron. What involvement have you and your group had on this, and how will that impact this current campaign, or will this current campaign impact that desire by OPG? We've been very heavily involved in those issues. We've been part of the public hearings. There are two processes going on. One is for what they call low and medium level radioactive waste, which means anything except the nuclear fuel bundles. And that's the one currently proposing within a, a mile of Lake Huron. In addition, at the same time, they're going through a lengthier process for where to put all the nuclear fuel bundles out of the power plants. And Six of the facilities that they are looking at are within the Great Lakes Basin, some of them up on Lake Superior, a few in the area just off of Lake Huron as well. This uh, clearly is one of the factors that we're trying to use the, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement as a way to get them more involved in looking at the long-term implications of actions like this, and therefore it is directly part of our strategy uh, in, in terms of dealing with that. A lot of people are saying, you know, we shouldn't do it within the basin uh, and we shouldn't have the nuclear disposal within those basins and so on. And I have to admit that I have a very mixed reaction to that. I totally want to support the Great Lakes. I've spent 30 years fighting to protect the Great Lakes. But I also have spent the same 30 years fighting with waste issues, uh, be they hazardous waste, municipal waste, in communities all around beyond the Great Lakes Basin saying, hey, we don't want that toxic incinerator there either. No, we don't want that toxic landfill there either. It isn't like it's something that should go anywhere. And the position that I personally and my organization has been taking is to say that these are not acceptable facilities. We need a plan for phase-out. Then if we have a plan for phase-out, we can figure out the best way to deal with the waste already generated. But what we're terrified of is if we get these things built, that's giving the go-ahead for the industry to expand and grow and grow. And that's a disaster, as if it wasn't bad news already. It's that message that, okay, this is taken care of, you can go ahead now and grow, is a total disaster. What has been the response to the call that went out on March 2nd for action on the radionuclides in the Great Lakes, such as we've been discussing just now? The reaction was the one that I expected, and, it, and in effect it was the proper reaction. The governments have received it, the request for it to be designated. They now have to enter the process for designating. So they haven't made any comment in terms of whether they think it's a good idea or not because they have this process now that they have to go through. That could take several months easily. It could take six months. You know, governments tend not to be quick at making these decisions, but they certainly have not indicated their position on doing that. And, of course, Canadian government must move more quickly than the U.S. government if you're saying something will actually take place in six months. <laughs> well, um, I, I, I'm always a dreamer. I, I'm con always confident. That's how I keep going all these years on these issues. Uh, so, yes, we are going to get somewhere in six months. I can't guarantee it. Then what happens, of course, if they do designate it is – to develop a strategy. They give themselves a timeline of one year to have developed the strategy. And if we could have a, a good strategy pulled together that there was heavy public engagement in, in a year that was a good strategy, I'd be very pleased with that. I mean, we've been a lot of years already trying to deal with these issues. I, I'm not worried if it takes another year to develop a really good strategy and then to get that implemented. In your mind, what would be an appropriate strategy that could be followed through that would give us 
some sense that this issue is being covered? What we would want the strategy to be is to be consistent with what is already in the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. The Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement says that the strategy has to include more monitoring and more science. The science to help us understand what are the impacts on the Great Lakes already, to understand the cumulative impacts, what the impacts may become in the future if we don't act now and allow things to get worse. So that's one component which is required of the governments in the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. The other component is the actions that need to be taken to avoid the problems. And again, being guided by the Water Quality Agreement that the government signed, they created it, we all made input, but they agreed to it, is that a preventive approach has to be there, that we have to avoid uh, potential for problems. We're not basing this on risk management, which is what we hear all the time. Instead, it's to say we have to get rid of the sources. We have to stop the sources. And in addition, the agreement uses the zero discharge is one of the words in the agreement which would guide the strategy. Another word in the agreement is virtual elimination, which again guides the strategy. And virtual elimination means that the strategy has to help us get to the point of reducing the radionuclides in the Great Lakes. Obviously, there are substances in there, radionuclides there from natural sources. And so when we say virtual elimination, we mean virtual elimination as a result of human activities. So it's really to develop a plan for the phase-out of these sources that are releasing materials to the basin. Does the technology currently exist that would allow that to happen? Well, I think the prior technology we have to look at is why are those facilities there in the first place, and it's to generate energy. And there's all kinds of studies out there from all kinds of scientists that say we don't need to be building more and more nuclear power plants, an incredibly expensive source of energy as well. We can't afford to keep doing that either. And therefore, it's quite realistic to think we can phase those out. We're not saying close it tomorrow, but to have a plan for phasing it out and to have a commitment for phasing it out. Likewise, then, I mean, yes, there are wastes already there that we would have to deal with, and that's going to be a, not a perfect solution in terms of dealing with the wastes already there, and we'll have to make compromises on, in doing that. But, but I'd rather that than having more and more waste coming all the time so that our risk from the waste would keep increasing. We can't keep generating more of these wastes. I would hope that one of the things we would have learned from our experience with nuclear power is that you should never use a technology or a chemical until you know that you have a safe way to deal with the waste after you've used the chemical or after you've used the technology. We went into this technology in the 50s in both countries, Canada and the U.S., and we knew we didn't know what to do with the hazardous waste. And then decades later, we still have scientists, you know, the National Academy of Sciences, for example, saying we still have a lot of unknowns about how to deal with these incredibly toxic wastes that will last forever. You know, the EPA and Environment Canada both say we need to keep the high-level radioactive waste separate from the environment forever, some say a million years, not that much of a difference. In my early days of doing nuclear hot seat, I spoke with a nuclear engineer who had been active in the 50s. And when I asked him how the technology was allowed to move forward when nobody knew what to do with the waste, he said that the engineers were just confident that by the time it was yep. a problem, it would That's be right. figured out. Unfortunately, we haven't reached that point yet. If I can just continue on that, I just think it's such an important lesson for us, not just in terms of nuclear, but other things. You know, the flame retardants that we brought in, PVDs, and now we're saying, oh, my goodness, we have to ban these. But we've got all these out in the environment already. How do we get rid of them? You know, PCBs, we finally end up banning them. We still have these all through the environment. These were substances that we knew when we started using them that we didn't know how to deal with them at the end of our lives, but we said not to worry. The engineers and the scientists will find a solution. Well, we've had too many examples already where we've gone decades and decades and half a century
still haven't found solutions. We should not have that confidence. I always refer to that as the... There, there, Missy, don't worry your pretty little head about it. The experts will take care of it. That's and, it. and we see what they have done with it. It seems that the work that you are doing, and all the other groups as well, is important not just for the Great Lakes, but that it has implications for the rest of the world. I would like to think it does. I think, first of all, I'd like one of the messages for people and elsewhere in the world to get out of it is the necessity for us to work across political boundaries, across those jurisdictional borders. And it's something that we in the Great Lakes have really struggled to do and knew that you know, this is one ecosystem we live in. And if we're not coming up with common solutions together, we're not going to solve the problem. I, I hope another lesson that will come out of this is that we have to look cumulatively at the impact of all the sources of this type of waste or this type of pollution, all of them together, not just one by one by one, because you look at them individually, they don't look that dramatic. You start piling them up together, and it's huge. And that's, that's again, something that all of us need to, to realize. And I, and I would hope that a strategy that we can come up with in the basin, if we come up with a good one, and I'm confident because of the pressure that is here, we will get a good strategy, that there were useful things in that for people in other parts of the world to use in their strategies. What has been the media response to the press release that you sent out last week? The media response has been quite a lot of coverage of it, and I think the main message out of it that has come from the media is the surprise and shock at the number of facilities and sources of radionuclides around the basin and the map. That map where people just look at it and they're startled. Wow, look at those spots all around the basin, you know, every, every state, every, every province around there except Lake Superior. And they're just shocked to realize the extent of it. Again, is an example where you don't just sit down and look at it as a whole. You look at it piece by piece by piece. And it doesn't really hit you what the real impact can be. What can the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat do to support you and support this campaign, be it in Canada or the United States? At this point, it's really important that we get this designated. And it's important for people, not just within the Great Lakes Basin, to be saying they think this is important, but for wherever, anywhere in the world, to say, hey, this is an important initiative. We're excited by this. We think this could be a really valuable precedent for all of us and to inform the U.S. and Canadian governments of that and of the support to have this done and of support to have a strategy developed that we all could learn from. The U.S. and Canadian governments are open to flattery. <laughs> if people elsewhere say, hey, we think you could do an important precedent here, I think that can have an influence on them. We will, of course, be posting the relevant links up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode. Is there anything else that we can be doing that is going to support this campaign and hopefully hurry it along? The most important thing, as I said at this point, to move along the pressure for the designation is to say that you support the idea and that you want to see the designation happen. I think the other thing that we could be doing as all of us is to start developing what we think a strategy could be. And for people's ideas elsewhere in the world, not just here in the Great Lakes Basin, we're far from having all the information and knowledge that we need and all the ideas for how to solve these problems, but to share our information with each other in terms of what a strategy could look like so that when we get to the strategy stage, we're really ready to come forward with a leading edge progressive and aggressive strategy. If people were to get in touch with you and share these strategy ideas with you or offer resources, what's the best way for them to do it? They could contact me at jjackson, J-J-A-C-K-S-O-N, at W-E-B as in boy, dot C-A. So I think it's an exciting opportunity. We try all the angles we can and uh, you know, having this, this agreement, this binational agreement, has been so important for our work in the Great Lakes Basin, and this is just one more example of using that agreement to, to try to move forward.
John Jackson, thank you so much for the work that you are doing, for your decades of dedication to these issues, and for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. John Jackson of the Canadian Environmental Law Association and many more environmental groups. We will have a copy of that map that he spoke about up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 248. Next, we check in with Jane Swanson of San Luis Obispo Mothers for Peace on the Diablo Canyon nuclear reactors. This is to focus on a piece of California legislation that could inadvertently trigger support for keeping those dangerous, failing, earthquake zone reactors open. What is the Diablo Canyon propaganda bill, if that is its official name, and what does it consist of? The official name is Senate Bill 968, sponsored by Senator Monty. We don't believe his intent is to provide propaganda to keep Diablo Canyon open far beyond its licensing, but we think it is in danger of having that effect. What the bill asks for is an economic study of all the downsides economically at the time when the Diablo plant will close. We don't know if it's going to close next year or at the end of its current licenses in 2024 or 2025, or if PG&E is going to pursue license extension. But in due time, it will close and there will be an economic impact on this county. So it sounds like the bill is all very friendly and trying to be helpful, but all it does is study the negatives without looking at the positives because there are positives to the closing and there's an opportunity there to make a plan in advance for moving to renewables and to create jobs actually and to avoid the dangers of having a nuclear power plant sitting on many earthquake faults. That gets to Diablo Canyon itself, which has two reactors operating on the coast of Northern California. What's wrong with the facilities at Diablo Canyon? First of all, those earthquake faults that you mentioned, there are four of them that are extremely close, 13 faults very nearby. One fault goes within a few hundred meters of the plant. There are two reactors, each containing a thousand times of the long-lived radioactivity of the Hiroshima bomb. So it's a serious danger. Most of the radioactive waste is in the pools, which are not well protected. It's just one risk after another that we don't need because we don't actually need the energy produced by Diablo Canyon. The state of California, the independent system operators declare that our state has 30% or sometimes I hear more, but at least 30% excess energy in general. And we don't need the 8% of energy that's supplied by Diablo Canyon. So it is not worth the risk. What about an evacuation plan? You live along the coast of California, which is where the reactor is. If that thing goes south in any appreciable way, what would be the likelihood that people could get out? Well, forget it. If you get in your car, you're just going to sit on the freeway and go nowhere because we have one major road going out of the area. Highway 101 goes north and south. There's Highway 58. That's a two-lane road that'll get you over to Highway 5 eventually. Entirely impossible to evacuate. Really, the best option is pretty pathetic. It's called shelter in place. And what that means is to get out your masking tape, put it around your doors and windows, turn off any airflow moving from the outside, and hope the plume blows away pretty quickly so you're not stuck there for, you know, five years. (laughs) at Fukushima. You know, a serious radioactive contamination does not go away. So sheltering in place is pretty awful. But to be honest with you, that's what I would do because otherwise you're just going to sit in your car. It's going to be such a terrible traffic jam. You're not going to go anywhere and you're totally unprotected if you're sitting in your car. Going back to Senate Bill 968, what has been done to try to amend it and how successful has that been? San Luis Obispo Mothers for Peace, the group for which I'm speaking, we have had numerous conversations with Senator Monning himself as well as with his staffer. We've made it very clear that one of our objections to the bill is that it puts PG&E in charge of finding an 
independent, see the quotation marks, an independent firm to assess the negative economic impacts of plant closure. This is like the fox guarding the chicken coop because pg e is well known for appointing research entities that are not the least bit independent. They've done it over and over again. In other words, they're very pro-nuclear. They'll skew the numbers in that direction. Oh. Well, of course. And the effect of the bill, again, I'm not saying this Senator Monning intends it, but the effect of the bill is like a stampede. It's already happening. The unions, uh, some of the unions are taking out full page ads. They've done two ads in San Luis Obispo papers. They've done one in Sacramento saying that they need to save the jobs at Diablo Canyon. Everybody get together and keep that plant open because we need the jobs. So such a study of only the negative impacts of closure would just add to that propaganda. That's where the word propaganda comes from in trying to stampede politicians, elected officials, into taking stands to try to keep Diablo open. What we think the bill, and we've suggested amendments, so that the bill should also study the positive effects of plant closure and start right now. Don't wait for the uh, date of closure to happen, but right now start building more renewables in this area that can provide jobs and other economic benefits. Furthermore, the bill is completely unnecessary because in 2013, PG&E did gather all the information that the mining bill purports to need. They have a report. It's online at the PG&E website. If you do a search for Diablo Canyon employees or employment, and PG&E has stated in response to the mining proposal that it plans to update that document on a regular basis. So the bill would accomplish nothing that's not already there as far as these statistics go. So what the bill needs to be doing instead and what we have suggested is, I already said, to study the positives of closure. And we think the bill should direct all state agencies with authority affecting Diablo to decline to grant approvals that would be needed for Diablo to operate longer than its original 40-year design and license life. The listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat are a very motivated bunch of people. What can we do to help What people can do is phone the chairperson of the California Committee on Energy, Utilities, and Communications. His name is Ben Hueso, and grab your pencil, everybody. The phone number is 916-651-4040. People could call Ben Hueso's office and tell him that they are opposed to Senate Bill 968 because it would accomplish nothing to lessen the impact of the closure, the economic impact, and it would do nothing to protect the people of the Central Coast, that they would prefer a bill that really seriously looks at alternative energy sources and the creation of jobs in the area. That was Jane Swanson of San Luis Obispo Mothers for Peace. We'll have a link up on the website to contact that legislator behind the wrong-headed, propagandistic bill. It will be on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 248. Activist shout-out! Nuclear Information and Resource Service, or NEARS, has launched a new campaign. They started on March 15th, and it's called Hashtag Nuclear is Dirty. Yeah, think? Over the next 12 weeks, NEARS will be rolling it out through a series of online events, publications, and social media forums. Nuclear is Dirty is meant to inform the public of the real environmental impacts of nuclear power, from the mining of uranium and production of reactor fuel, all the way through to the long-term storage and management of radioactive waste. To get all the updates and know when the events are happening, You can sign up for email, if you haven't already, at nears.org. That's N like Nancy, I-R-S like Sam, dot org. And I really need to acknowledge whoever or however many are the brains behind the miningawareness.wordpress.com site. He, she, and or they send out email, multiple emails on a daily basis, on an ever-growing range of nuclear issues that are thoroughly researched and footnoted, then blisteringly well-written. 
Many have content that exceeds my technical understanding, but even the most challenging of them provide accessible information and help one to connect the nuclear dots. If you haven't signed up for this email thread yet, I suggest you do so. Go to miningawareness.wordpress.com. It's a little obscure, so you have to scroll down the left-hand column all the way to the bottom, where you'll see a teeny tiny box that reads, follow blog via email. Fill in your email address, click on it, and you'll be getting the email. Not a lot of people do this. I saw that there were only 108 people signed up for the email, and there really should be a lot more, because we all deserve to have access to this valuable source of verifiable information. Here's today's final thought. I have no final thought. Literally. None. I am all thought out. For now, check this space again next week. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, March 22, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from... ENEnews.com, Yahoo.com, TheGuardian.com, Dianuke.org, MiningAwareness.wordpress.com, see, I told you, AGreenRoad.blogspot.com, DeUnRenard.wordpress.com, Asahi.com, Fukushima 311 Watchdogs, NEuropa.eu, Global Research, AirForceTimes.com, Union of Concerned Scientists at UCSUSA.org, TheVillager.com, Gallup.com, TimesFreePress.com, CommonDreams.org, RollingStone.com, SeattleTimes.com, EnviroReporter.com, EuropeanNewsWeekly.wordpress.com, and the ever stalwart Sean Arclight who provides content, Mainichi.com, the Nuclear Rubber Stamp uh, uh, Regulatory Commission, and the fabulous darling, fabulous activists who gather on the Nuclear Hot Seat site on Facebook which you are all invited to visit and like. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompanied by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV on StuWebRadioNetwork.com, in New Zealand by NewZSentinel.com, and ActivateMedia.org. We are always looking for other networks to connect with, so if you know a news aggregator or community radio station that would like to carry the show, do put us in touch. And make sure you check out our archive. We are over 245 episodes to the good. And you can find them on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com. You can find the vast majority of them on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, courtesy Ms. Milky the Clown and Joni Ray. And they're also archived on iTunes. And please remember, your contributions are what help keep Nuclear Hot Seat the vital force it is for honest, accurate nuclear news. So please, do what you can this week to help us out with a donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.